Thank you, Sigrid. Uh, thank you, Johannes, for uh, first of all asking us to 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 do this, uh, to organize this Rob Arc 2018, but also for tracing now this short sort of uh, story of Rob Arc. That is also a bit the story of uh, of robotics uh, uh, in architecture, and for grabbing out this. Old, uh, <laughs> nice, nice uh, uh, video where you, we don't. You all see this uh, the, 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 the small size of the experiment, but we also recognize old collaborators that were very uh, important back then. Uh, so I would like to. I think I have just two minutes. Uh, I would like to welcome everybody. Although I think not everybody is here yet. Doesn't matter. Uh, to this uh, event here in Zurich. I would like to do this on behalf of the NCCR Digital Fabrication. That NCCR Digital Fabrication has been introduced by Philipp Block uh, yesterday uh, evening uh, at this uh, opening that was sort of the transition, transitioning between the Digital Concrete Conference that was uh, uh, hold here, held here as uh, on Monday and Tuesday, and the Rob Arc 18. And this has uh, a lot to do with the spirit of the NCCR, uh, with the title and with the title uh, of this conference, Radical Cross Disciplinarity. And I think we will have uh, the chance to engage in the next two days uh, uh, on this topic, so what does this mean? How far does this reach? Uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, for those that have not, uh, uh, could, could not be here yesterday evening, maybe I would like to just share one thought that, because uh, along this, the years and the conference, the question for all of us is where are we going? So what's, what's next and uh, how can we uh, make sure that this uh, force will change things, will have an impact beyond uh, our nice discourse, academia and paper and so on. And one thing that I observed uh, in the last three days in the workshop, you will all have, the, for those that have not uh, seen them yet, uh, the chance to see the result uh, in the workshop, as well as in the discussion yesterday and in the very uh, inspiring keynote by Chris Lübkemann yesterday uh, evening, is the human factor. So we start to have uh, technologies, uh, augmented reality, artificial intelligence, and they are very nicely reflected in, in, in the work of the workshops that allow us, first of all, to integrate ourselves in the loop, so to truly collaborate. And I'm not only talking about security issues. This can also be solved through this, but I'm, this addresses many other layers. And the very interesting thing uh, on these new developments is that I believe uh, or would like to discuss if this could be the key to really introduce this technology in the building construction in the short term, both off-site and on-site. Okay. Now, uh, my real task here is not to share thoughts with you, but to introduce Mette, uh, Mette Ramsgar thompson uh, I'm very glad that she accepted uh, to be here with us, that she accepted our invitation. Mette is professor, uh, uh, leads, uh, founded the CITA uh, at the Royal Academy of Fine Arts in Copenhagen. CITA stands for Center of Information Technology in Architecture. Uh, Mette uh, is uh, there since a long time in our Seen. She has done uh, many uh, uh, important uh, uh, pieces of work that influenced uh, uh, us all. And I think the most uh, uh, characteristic uh, approach uh, of CETA is to really engage uh, in, in very complex, in modeling, try to understand and then modeling very complex material behavior that goes often <coughs> beyond <coughs> what you can uh, understand. Uh, so she, she focuses on the materials, she focuses on the connection between materials and processes and their modeling in order to uh, make it accessible to design. 
uh, I think she will show you, uh, show us uh, uh, a lot of old work, but also I hope new things that are happening in CETA that has grown into a very influential and big group. So let uh, uh, me welcome uh, uh, Mette. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Fabio. Thank you very much, everyone, for inviting me here. I'm super excited to be here, and um, I think it's just wonderful to see how this thing is growing. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to, um, I'm gonna read a little bit. I'm really sorry about it, but you've given me a very short time, and I wanna say a lot. <laughs> so I'm gonna, I hope you forgive me. So I know that this is a conference about robotics, um, but as uh, Fabio rightly predicted, I want to talk about modeling. It's not to uh, disregard what's happening here, but really to highlight what I think is a core contribution to the field that we are all participating in. Um, in our new, um, let's just get used to the, yep. In our new uh, cross-disciplinary uh, practice, um, the model becomes the place which um, information is shared and integrated into new workflows. Um, often this is part of the architect's remit, but where results often foreground the particular material systems or the structural solutions, the innovation of the actual infrastructures that enable these are often overlooked. I want to discuss the increasingly complex conceptual and practical tools that we are evolving um, to be able to work intelligently with materials. Their specification, prediction of behavior, and ability to steer fabrication processes at multiple scales. As we are all keenly aware, contemporary building culture stands under enormous pressure. The numbers vary from source to source, but they are all alarming. Globally, we use 40% of all resources and energy in construction, and with population growth and urbanization taken into account, we'll be building buildings for 2.3 million more people over the next 35 years. It's therefore clear that real innovation is, um, is uh, needed. Digitization and the creation of methods um, with which we work more optimally with construction is understood as the key means by which this innovation can take place. And concepts such as Industry 4.0, cyber-physical systems, and so on, promise new digital material practices uh, by which we can better share, communicate uh, information, bridge between design and fabrication, and optimize construction. However, within them lies embedded the persistence of an industrialized paradigm and a covert desire to overcome fundamental bottlenecks by simply intensifying, informing, and optimizing. I think it's fair to ask, will these innovations be profound enough? Can we truly optimize ourselves out of the problem, or must we define new ways of understanding what building culture can be? What's interesting is that this crisis points so precisely to our material practices. What is at stake is the antiquated um, paradigms of industrialization and the fundamentally economic drivers of standardization and mass production, which lead to materially intense building practices relegated with all that it entails of waste, dormant materials, and overproduction. The declared need for our era is to um, develop new material paradigms with which we can build more intelligently with less. A material paradigm in which computational interfaces are used to create feedback between different scales of design. Computational analysis is used to understand, parametricize, and design performances of material systems. And computational strategies are used to locally grade, tune, and optimize materials in respect to their employment. So, when we look to material science um, and engineering, then we uh, are often presented with an abstraction in which materials are described as structures. Mark Miodinek tells us that there are no materials, but only different structural hierarchies. And Ole Sigmund describes the isomorphism of material and structure as inherently similar, but occurring at different scales. As such, we find ourselves in a fundamental change of perception from a craft-based 
uh, understanding of materials as somehow given and pertaining to particular methods of production, refinement and detailing, to a designerly perception of materials as inherently composed and therefore open for manipulation. What appears as a multi-scale uh, multi design space in which otherwise disparate design agency becomes interfaced and connected. And as such, new questions emerge. How do we understand the interactions between performances occurring at different scales? How do we engage control and control their inherent circularity? And how do we understand external environment, uh, how an external environment impacts on their performances? And perhaps most perform profoundly, how do we gain uh, or access to their organization? What are the right physical, representational, and conceptual tools by which we can manipulate and control performance of material systems? So it's this question that CETA explores. Uh, in projects such as complex modeling, flora robotica, and InnoChain, we examine how working across scales uh, necessitate new kinds of methods, allowing us to understand, analyze, and formalize material behaviors and engage these with higher order structural um, uh, understandings of elements and their structure. At the center of this lies a fundamental inquiry into the nature of the future information model. If current paradigms such as BIM dictates measures of uniformity and conformity, these models are fundamentally distributed and heterogeneous. Instead of relying on classification of known practice, these models expand practice. So we enter a new landscape in which information models grow, self-organize, search, learn, sense, <laughs> are triggered, are coupled, are mechanistic, are predictive, are persistent, and organize data in very different ways that, than geometry and extension. So in this landscape, we have multiple breadths in which information is anything but unifying and conforming. Instead, it's dynamic, evolving, discrete, discontinuous, and most fundamentally, information-rich. So I wanted to go through some of the core things that we are looking at, the core concepts that shape these modeling paradigms. Without going into too much depth uh, into the projects, I want to use recent projects to exemplify how these methods are being prototyped. CETA's um, uh, central interest in material performance has led to a fundamental exploration uh, looking into integrating um, simulation. With Sael and Mark Barry is here. <laughs> um, the game changer of architecture is understanding simulation as part of the early stage uh, design practice. Here, simulation becomes a means of formalizing understandings of material behavior, enabling us to engage with their dynamics and inform design. Where early design um, investigation in CETA create a sort of dichotomy at lightweight, integrated, but not very precise simulation, as opposed to and correlated, evaluated by heavyweight, this uh, not integrated um, uh, FEA uh, ana analysis, we have now um, developed much more composite and convoluted uh, practice. In our participation in the development of um, K2 engineering, the real difference is that we can inform uh, projection-based simulations with explicit material behavior. In Isoropia that we developed for the uh, Venice Biennale this year, we use K2 engineering Let's see if I can, yes. Um, uh, K2 engineering to simulate the complex interactions between materials in material systems. K2 engineering is a multi-material system um, in which uh, the designed knitted membranes, we're creating the membranes, the textiles ourselves, um, are being stretched between uh, active bent fiberglass rods. Working at multiple scales, Isoropia merges the design agency of defining the actual stitches and therefore the material behavior and deciding which fibers to use um, and then the structural scale. Um, in Isoropia, we use different kinds of simulation methods for different purposes. 
The strong design integration of K2 engineering allows us to develop the shaping uh, in an interactive process. Wait a little bit. Yeah. Uh, where um, uh, isogeometric analysis, the experimental nerve based FEA, is then used to calculate how external forces impact on the structure. So we use two different kinds of practices of uh, simulation for different kinds of questions. Designed as an ultralight structure, it's guided by the concept of resilience. By designing intelligently with material performance, we conserve material by allowing the structure to receive wind forces and deflect dynamically in response to them. Of course, all buildings move, but Isropia deflects greatly, up to two meters on a six-meter beam length. So, like an umbrella in the wind. Um, in Bridge Too Far by Paul Nicholas, uh, this nesting of simulation is further strengthened. Bridge uses incremental sheet forming um, to transform hardened aluminium sheets into three-dimensional panels. It works in the same way that hammering steel does. It changes the microstructure of the material and hardens it in the process. So, um, um, the design of the performance therefore happens at multiple scales. The material is hardened, becoming stronger, but it's simultaneously thinned, becoming weaker. The process rigidizes sheets, making them three-dimensional and therefore stiffer, assembling in them into a skinned structure and into a structural arch, again stiffer. Bridges, um, see, you see thinner. Bridge asks, um, how do we understand the interactions of these multi-scale performances and how can they be orchestrated? Employing a multi-scale modeling paradigm, the project examines how coupling simulations at different scales allow us to pass information uh, between them and parametricize both performance and process-oriented models. Um, it imp employs a tactical strategy in which local variation in the scale of subdivisions correlate to higher degrees of complexity. Here, the mesh uh, becomes the shared interface between scales of design. MESS is no longer just a geometric descriptor, but instead a dynamically changing infrastructure that coarsens and refines so as to keep information at the right resolution level. Bridge is interesting, I think, because it introduces a graded material system into a material practice that's all otherwise all about standardization. Sensing is, of course, on all of our minds. It's the creation, uh, of, uh, the creation of evaluative models through simulation can be supported by sensing, whether it's by direct um, uh, part of the fabrication process, such as in Tom Swillen's uh, PhD, in which uh, 3D scanning is used to pre-register glue lamp blanks, or in Bridge, where we... Oops, sorry, there's missing a slide. But in Bridge, where we... Um, uh, use uh, sense data to uh, create adaptive modeling strategies. However, sensing can also inform our understanding of material systems. In our collaboration with Kieran Timberlake on the PCM facade, we explore phase-changing waxes. Designed through a multi-scale modeling paradigm, um, the ambition is to connect models of thermo thermo oops, sorry. Yeah. Uh, thermodynamic uh, behavior across scales to understand distributed design agency. Here, the macro scale, so the idea of the global climate model, the regional climate model, the city climate model, the uh, area, city area climate model, and down to uh, climate models that we develop ourselves of local environment, both uh, at the scale of the site, but also the scale of the building, um, uh, are interfaced. Uh, we are working with existing practice at Kieran Timberlake and their pointillist system. Um, here, early stage you know, sensor networks. And we put sensors into the materials and interface these with this larger landscape of models. So, early stage prototypical models are using sensors to inform mechanistic models that predict material behavior. Controlling the surface and exposure of the wax 
allows us to design panels with differing behavior depending on geometry. And here the point is that the panels are pretty alike. They assume approximately the same amount of material. By changing the panels containing uh, geometries, we can predict their we can change their behavior and the performance of translucency and opacity, uh, and thereby the temperature of the interior. PCM allows us to rethink concepts of interiority and environment. Rather than perceiving environment as containing and somehow homogenous, the project resurrects a cybernetic thinking of uh, environment and organism as being in continual dynamic interaction and an interscalar thinking of environment as that which is both containing but also contained. So we are then able to design the actual performance of the panels um, through differing panels creating different opacity. Yeah, so these new modeling methodologies introduce the dilemma of working in information-rich modeling. Integrating simulation and working with sensing means working with a lot of data, and therefore necessarily also what kinds of logics that these informations can be evaluated, structured, and directly interfaced with design strategy. In CETA, over our uh, last five years, we've been trying to understand how cases for machine learning can become a meaningful tool in design. And we foresee a series of emergent practices, as we call them, and I want to name three of them. Um, uh, the first one being the mapping of a solution space. So if we sort of uh, assume that we are now working in an environment where we're generating models, um, in Learning to be a Vault, which is a small sketch project that I did together with David Stasiuk, um, we're using k-means clustering uh, to evaluate a vast solution space. So we generate um, 2,000 models, all optimized along the Pareto front, um, and then we sort them. We sort them with an um, unsupervised uh, learning uh, algorithm. The key move in, in uh, uh, and then we get these families. So we get these, you can see clear familiarity between these columns, but we have not imposed a, a, a system of organization on them. It emerges from the practice. So what the key move in, in learning to be a vault is to couple a generative system with an evaluative system but to, and to use parameterization to be able to understand these, but to not use the same parameters. So by discoupling the parameters of evaluation from generation, we're, otherwise we're in this sort of echo chamber. But if we're disconnecting, we can then interface the understanding of a design space with designerly and intuitive uh, thinking. The parsing of design space, the second emergent practice, sense data invariably allows us to work with a lot of data, and we need new practices for normalizing data. Machine learning is an important method for making sense of data and creating predictive models. In Bridge Too Far, fabrication-aware models use machine learning to create strategies of continual adaptation, while in PCM Facade, the iteration of panel design uh, is informed using machine learning to predict material state change and rank design features. And the last one I want to go through is the short-circuiting of simulation. I think one of the most interesting case, um, uh, use cases for machine learning is its in, in its interaction with design simulation. Here, machine learning becomes an interesting alternative to br brute force strategies. In uh, LACEWAR, machine learning is used um, to, uh, uh, at two scales, uh, both at the performance of the single cell, the cells that are made in fiberglass and cable net, um, and in the overall assembly. LACEWAR is a form-active hybrid structure uh, uh, in which we are uh, using uh, 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 like in Isoropia, we use, it's a highly interdependent system in which the tension forces um, of the cable net interact with the compression uh, forces of the active bent fiberglass rod. And it's made out of these cable uh, cells with different uh, cable nets designed for uh, different load cases. Here, machine learning is used at two scales. At the scale of the unit, we train an artificial neural network to optimize the single cells in response to deformation and particular meeting points, allowing assembly. And at the scale of the wall, we use uh, strategic, um, 
uh, statistical probability to map the cells back into the war. Um, here, brute force strategies uh, simulating the aggregate behavior of the entirety of the wall prove too time consuming. Instead, we simulate the wall behavior once and then we use machine learning to map performances of the selected cells um, back into the wall. These processes present alternative strategies to the embedded reductionism of parametric modeling. Here, models exist in multiples, in thousands of models, that are spawned by generative systems to then be an analyzed by learning systems. Models are no longer singular endpoints, but belong to processes of expansion, increasing in number and in complexity by each time step of evolu uh, evolution. The designer becomes part of a design cycle in which classification, querying, and management of data sets become new design concepts. These very different kinds of representations are also inspiring us to reconsider material practice. In Flora Robotica, Phil Ayers is examining braiding as a material system and using the direct link between graph modeling and material connectivity uh, to shape new kinds of braids that are topological uh, possible and principled in their design, but for which no fabrication process exists. Flora Robotica is an interdisciplinary project into biosynthetic uh, systems. Here, robots are built um, uh, to interface with living plants and coexist with their growth cycles. Early work explores how robots can maypole dance, exotic uh, choreographies here, um, uh, braid systems, interlacing the fibers into structures, complex structures that can split, reassemble, become hyperbolic, all whilst, uh, all whilst gaining structural performance from the inherent friction that the interlacing introduces into the system. The control of the material organization becomes a choreography, steering the robots in their dance. I think there are two points to make here. First, of course, that robots are not limited um, to industrial robots, but are actuated systems that we build. Secondly, that the steering of fabrication is a multi-design uh, space um, that coincides with the steering of material organization. To conclude, I believe um, that we are going through an extremely creative time in which our representations are radically changing in nature. Where computation first challenged architecture by introducing a new encoded depth into its logics of extension and projection, new information-rich paradigms are fundamentally enriching what we can do. In architecture, creativity and conceptual understanding is profoundly linked uh, to our means of representation. I think we are only just at the starting point of reckoning what these changes will do. However, the environmental, social, and urban uh, crisis infuses an urgency into this. There is an underlying question of impact that foreshadows this field. How can these new material systems become effective alternatives to existing practice? How are we going to think their implementation, and if at all, do they integrate with existing building practice, both material and procedural? I believe that the contributions here and with you are not only in the literal production of a new braid or a new knitting system or a new steel panel, but also in the creation of new prototypical methods by which these systems and their underlying infrastructures can be thought. I think this is a contribution that we all have stake in and that we need to find ways to foreground and make meaningful. Thank you. I think, uh, thank you very much for the inspiring lecture. I think uh, you, you were reading it, but uh, we, we were, I, I was not feeling that you were reading. Oh, good. <laughs> it uh, doesn't happen often. Uh, I think we are a bit late, but uh, I think it would be a pity not to uh, okay, okay, take sorry. a few questions, spend a few minutes discussing uh, what uh, Matt uh, just presented us. Is there a question? Too early? Okay, then I will ask you some one thing. Uh, I want to go into specific because this 
take too long, we can do it uh, separately. But uh, your conclusion was that uh, there is this sense of urgency that is everywhere. Uh, uh, so we need to react fast on, uh, on, <clears throat> on the big uh, uh, questions we have to, to solve in our, in, our, in our world. And on the other side, and uh, these are just you, we also have the same yeah, feeling. We're yeah. scratching on the surface of something very, very big and interesting, but also complex. And this creates a big question. So there is a gap between scratching on the surface, uh, the education uh, paradigms we still live in, mm -hmm. you know, not knowing exactly what, where we are going, and having to solve problems in the next five years. This just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. What do you think about this? It's dilemma. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a, it's, I don't know, but I think um, it's fire under the feet kind of thing, no? where at one level, I think maybe we, as a field, we come from a formalist uh, interest also. There was, you know, a great desire for looking at new formal languages and so on. I think that time is somehow being uh, uh, pressured by these new kinds of questions. And I think when you look at these kinds of projects from the outside, I, I don't mean only ours, but ours as a field, it can look very self-indulgent. And um, it can look like, oh, then we're creating some crazy braid system, or oh, we find a new way to use concrete in a particular way, and we can make nice panels that are, are, are three-dimensional or whatever. But I, that's what I want to try to say here now, is that, yes, it looks like that, but underneath the hood, mm -hmm. we are we're creating the methods of the future. And I think we should be much more assertive about this, especially in interdisciplinary collaboration. I think architects have the, uh, I don't know why, but somehow we create the stage and then we somehow disappear from the stage. So it's often when we look at results from our field, we don't look at the sort of architectural contribution. I think it's incredibly important for us to be assertive about our role and the significance of what we are, are creating. Um, and that's the first step, because if we, as soon as we become much more aware of what's happening in, in creating all these crazy models, I, I know you are all, because you cannot work in this practice without working with crazy models, but being much more um, sort of zooming out and understanding how these models also per pertain to practice. I think that's the first step in, in making these practices even possible to work with. But it's not a good answer. It's an honest uh, yeah. uh, answer. And I think the yeah. point that we should all be more uh, assertive about what we generate is, is, is the starting point. Mm -hmm. So not then say, okay, it's just a little small poetic installation for an exhibition, but yeah. it's much more than that. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Mette. I think we will now have the first break. See you later. Thank you. Thank you.